Hey everybody, this is Christine Chandler coming to you live from home once again. I'm gonna come after you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ruin you. Anyway. Uh. Electric, catch all power. Pew! No donations, less than one dollar. It's all right, take a chance, cause there is no circumstance that you can't handle. <laughs> you have to offer money. Yeah. <laughs> 100 bucks and I'll get up. Oh, and how about this? I get the angry! <laughs> This video will contain vague discussions surrounding abuse, mental illness and other potentially sensitive topics. View discretion is advised. You can head over to my Patreon for an ad-free, uncut version of this video, which goes into more detail on the particularly disturbing and not safe for work elements of this story. Chris Chan is a name I've heard tossed around on the internet, but for whatever reason, I never actually looked into it until now, and I don't think anything could have prepared me for what I've learnt in the past few days. To call this story a roller coaster would be an understatement. It's probably the most complex and bizarre rabbit hole I've ever been down. I hope this video serves as a comprehensive but concise timeline of events, but this video would be hours long if I covered everything, as Chris has been referred to as the most documented person on the internet. I've included the main details and elaborated in certain areas, but if you want to know more, head over to sonichu.com, which is a whole website dedicated to Chris's life story. Just to clarify, Chris is a transgender woman, and events relevant to the story occurred both before and after she came out. I'll be using she and her pronouns throughout, but I just wanted to make it clear that until a certain point, she was living as a biological man. That detail is relevant to the story at points, and it's useful to know because different sources use different pronouns to describe her. Her birth name was Christopher Weston Chandler, and she later went by Christian after a mall conductor bear misheard, which she believed was a sign from God. She would, at times, add in other names as middle names, such as Ricardo, which is apparently her Spanish nickname. After she came out, she changed her name to Christine, and is commonly known as the gender-neutral name Chris. For simplicity, that's the name that we'll be using throughout. Chris was born on the 24th of February 1982 in Charlottesville, Virginia. She was Barbara Chandler's second child. Her first, Joseph, was around 18 at the time. He claimed to have been mentally and physically abused by Barbara and his stepfather, and it seems that Chris was also abused by her, though not to the same extent. It has been speculated that Barbara has some form of narcissistic personality disorder, and she reportedly used violence and threats of suicide to manipulate Chris and Chris's father, Bob. Not much is known for sure about Chris's first years, though she began showing signs of autism, such as delayed language acquisition. She didn't speak at all between the ages of one and seven, and had to undergo speech therapy. She has recalled memories and made claims about her early life, though as you'll soon come to learn, she's hardly the most reliable source. She claims that her first word was monkey at just six weeks old, which obviously isn't true, and I wonder if she made it up to compensate for her delayed speech. She claims she was abused by a babysitter every day for years, and that she was locked in a toy room at an early age after turning all the lights off. Another traumatic event occurred when her playmate, Sarah Nicole Hammer, convinced her that Casper the Friendly Ghost lived under her house. Chris crawled in to look, and Sarah locked her in. This was a pivotal moment in more than one way. 
It was perhaps the first time that Chris had ever been trolled, and the inability to distinguish between reality and fiction was something she carried with her into adulthood. She didn't appear to hold any animosity towards Sarah though, and despite the fact that it appears that they had next to no contact since they were young kids, Chris still spoke of her as an adult as if she was her best and closest friend. During the fourth grade, Chris's parents pulled her out of school after she claimed she had been forcefully restrained and made to sit on the principal's lap. Throughout the court proceedings, Chris was homeschooled until they relocated and she started at a different school in the sixth grade. This homeschooling period may well have further hindered Chris's already delayed social development. In high school, she had a few female friends and like Sarah, Chris seems to fixate on and over-exaggerate their closeness in later years. It was during this time that she created the notorious character Sonny Chu for a school project, which came about after she was told that she couldn't use copyrighted characters, so she instead decided to merge two copyrighted characters, Sonic the Hedgehog and Pikachu, Sonny Chu. She would later go on to draw comics featuring Sonny Chu, which is what she became known on the internet for. Signs of her parents enabling her behaviour were really starting to show, and she stormed out crying during her high school graduation when she didn't win the art award. She felt she deserved it because she'd worked harder than anyone else, despite her autism. It's clear that her parents never prepared her for the real world, or taught her about boundaries and societal norms, and as a result, she never matured at the same rate as her peers. <coughs> She entered adulthood unable to fit into society and unready to find employment or take care of herself, sometimes not even recognising when she needed to use the bathroom, which has resulted in various accidents over the years. After high school, Chris enrolled on a college course on computer-aided drafting and design. She didn't make many, if any, friends in college and started spending more of her free time creating Sonny Chu comics. They started out pretty average, but became more and more personal to Chris. Eventually, she was clearly using the comics as a coping mechanism by inserting herself into them and characters based off other real people. Some of the storylines were inspired by real events, but she rewrote what actually happened to reflect how she wanted the interaction to go or to make other people seem like the villains. In February 2003, Chris was kicked out of a college class following a dispute with her teacher. She claims this was because of her autism, which was almost becoming a crutch to excuse her inappropriate behaviour, a method learned from her parents, who basically taught her how to use autism as a pass to get what she wanted. In reality, it may have had something to do with her verbally attacking classmates and making racist remarks. After she was ejected from class, she cried, but there was no one to comfort her. Chris decided it was time to find herself a girlfriend, or sweetheart, as she called it, and so began the love quest. It didn't go particularly well, and every girl she spoke to already had a boyfriend, leading her to believe that only a very tiny percentage of women were boyfriend-free, as she called it. This is known as the infinitely high boyfriend factor. The first time Chris became aware of this may have been when she found out that her childhood friend Sarah had a boyfriend, after developing a crush on her. This realisation was almost phobic to her and prevented her from finding the courage to approach women, let alone strike a conversation. This also caused her to really start hating men because they were taking all the women that fit her strict criteria. Said criteria included that they had to be aged between 18 and the age that Chris was at the time. This went on for a few years. They had to be boyfriend free, of average to slim build, white, employed in a relatively well-paying job, and not autistic. As she suffered an almost paralysing fear of approaching women, she came up with some interesting ways to attempt to attract someone. She would sit in a public place for hours, sometimes pacing back and forth, holding a sign stating that she was looking for a female companion. Unsurprisingly, women weren't exactly falling at her feet, and she ended up getting into trouble for loitering and soliciting. Her unusual methods and threatening behaviour was condemned by the dean at the college, who expelled her for one year. She returned and obtained an associate's degree in 2006, but things just went even more downhill from here. 
Chris's degree would end up being a big waste of time, considering she never used it to get a job, and she began claiming welfare soon after leaving college. After college, her life consisted solely of drawing Sonny Chew, playing video games, and focusing on her love quest. She created some Sonny Chew medallions, one of which of the character Sonny Chew, and she was rarely ever seen without it around her neck. As I already mentioned, Chris wasn't exactly prepared for adult life, partly due to her autism, but partly due to her parents enabling her. She was always quite childlike, and throughout the years, spent thousands of dollars on kids' toys. She was into My Little Pony, and years later began attending BronyCon. She also had some pretty controversial views. She was religious, as her parents were, and was also very homophobic, though seemingly not as a result of religion, as she only realised that the Bible condemns homosexuality after seeing an episode of Family Guy. People of the uh, wrong orientation are uh, using the uh, S brand, uh, and by which I mean particularly the uh, homosexuals. For some reason, Chris had a bee in her bonnet relating to Asperger's syndrome. She didn't seem to really understand what it is, but has repeatedly stated that it is nothing like autism, and she thinks people with Asperger's are stealing the limelight from people with autism. While Chris doesn't necessarily seem inherently racist, she is clearly racially ignorant, and has made insensitive comments in the past, as well as stereotyping characters in her comics, and she also did blackface at one point. But there is a clear distinction in the way she views gay people and people of other races. She made it clear her sweetheart needs to be white, but that seems more related to a dream she had prophesizing a daughter named Crystal, who was white, so it made sense that the mother would also be white. Chris held many delusional beliefs, one being that he had over one billion fans, and that Sonny Chu was more popular than Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. Most of Chris's time was spent inside, though she would visit a local game and card shop, where she met Megan Schroeder in 2005. Chris almost instantly developed a crush on her, but she wasn't interested in being anything more than friends, as she claimed to have recently been through a bad breakup. The pair became close friends, but Chris constantly pushed boundaries and basically harassed Megan, believing that she would eventually change her mind. Emails between the pair have surfaced, where Megan repeatedly tells Chris she isn't looking for a boyfriend, and just wants to be friends with her. She initially declines very politely, and eventually has to be more blunt with her, but still handles the situation better than most would. She mentions that Chris keeps getting too close and touching her, and describes her advances as sexual harassment. Most of Chris's emails are missing, but it's clear that she is not taking no for an answer, and has no regard for Megan's feelings about the situation. In 2007, Chris entered a competition, hoping to win the prize that included a trip for two to Seattle. She planned to whisk Megan away, but she didn't win, and found out that Megan wouldn't have gone with her anyway. 2007 was also the year that the internet discovered Chris. One of her Sonny Chew pictures was posted on 4chan, and it didn't take long for the artist to be identified. From there, pages were dedicated to her on the website Something Awful, and on Encyclopedia Dramatica, or ED. This would be the first time that Chris would be exposed to a large number of people who weren't going to enable her, or make allowances due to her condition, and they were ruthless. Chris didn't exactly help herself, she uploaded a YouTube video attempting to convince ED to take down the page on her, but when that didn't work, she decided to reveal a lot of embarrassing information about herself. Oversharing is a common occurrence throughout this, trolls are gonna troll regardless, but Chris rarely fed them the bait, and often included photographic or video proof behind even the more bizarre details. She shared an inappropriate picture that she'd drawn of her and Megan, which was the straw that broke the camel's back in that relationship. By 2008, if she hadn't already, Chris was really starting to get desperate in her search for a sweetheart, even posting on Yahoo Answers for advice on how to get a boyfriend-free girl. One of the answers recommended that she get rid of the sign she used in public, to which Chris replied, asking if the commenter would be her sweetheart boyfriend-free girl. Chris's love quest took a temporary, unexpected turn when she found herself a sweetheart named Blanca. 
Only it turned out she wasn't even a real person, but rather a bunch of trolls operating under one fake account. For simplicity's sake, and because Chris didn't believe she was being catfished by multiple people, even when it was glaringly obvious, we'll refer to the trolls collectively as Blanca. Blanca sent multiple photos of herself, which were actually various different women, but Chris didn't realise because she has prosopagnosia, meaning she struggles to recognise faces. She claims to have spent a significant amount of time staring into the mirror when she was younger, just to be able to recognise her own face. Blanca convinced Chris to send nudes, which were published online in September 2008. Over the next few months, various other photos and videos of that nature found their way online. Icarus69, one of the trolls acting as Blanca, convinced Chris to send him the Sonichu medallion, which she did. He filmed himself cutting it up and putting it into a jar of pickles, then setting it on fire. This was traumatic for Chris, not only because her beloved medallion had been destroyed, but because she hated pickles due to their phallic shape. Still unaware that Blanca was not a real person, Chris seemed to go off her, and soon began communicating with a new sweetheart, Panda Halo. She convinced Chris to send nudes, which she posted online, and at one point even got Chris to agree to have sex with a dog for her enjoyment. Chris said that her breed of choice would have been a collie, like Lassie, but as far as I'm aware, she never went through with it. At least, I hope she never went through with it. And here's where things just get wild. Enter Clyde Cash. Mm. You know what makes me angry? This is Clyde. Clyde is an online persona created by a troll with a pretty extensive storyline. He claimed his brother took his own life after Chris withheld publication of Sonny Chew following the Encyclopedia Dramatica incident. Chris was somewhat upset to hear this, but didn't seem too phased, and later implied that she liked having enough influence over someone that they would take their own life because of something she did. Clyde, I'm sorry your brother died, but that doesn't mean you have to go picking on me for the cause of his death. I'm just an, I'm just an innocent bystander in all this. This sparked a rivalry that would span years, and at times get pretty messed up. And this is how angry I am for every waking moment that that ED page is up. In order to understand the impact of Clyde and the other trolls' actions, it's important to acknowledge that multiple people spent months, even years, creating numerous personas with elaborate backstories that sometimes linked the different characters, all just to troll Chris, and she rarely ever questioned it. No matter how far-fetched the fabricated events were, she naively believed everything, even when people tried to show her proof that she was being trolled. She had real difficulty telling apart fantasy and reality, even to the point that she believes that all fictional characters and worlds in books, movies and TV shows actually exist in a different dimension. She claimed that by the end of 2018, our dimension was supposed to merge with the other dimension, resulting in fictional characters physically existing in this world. She also believes that CW Seville, the setting she created for Sonichu, is a real place and seems to use it as a coping mechanism. Anyway, the point is, Chris was very gullible and naive, and her autism was likely the main cause of that, making her an easy target. Clyde and Panda Halo made up a wild story that started with Clyde Panda and her getting pregnant with his child and ended with Panda vanishing and Chris assuming that she died in the Black Saturday bushfires in 2009. This battle is far from, this war is far from beyond over, Mr. Clyde. By this point, multiple different trolls were posing as fans, sweethearts and even enemies and Chris was fully immersed in this fictional world, where not everyone was nice, but everything revolved around her. The next sweetheart would be Julie, who, like the rest, had quite the crazy storyline. In February 2009, Julie asked Chris to visit her in Ohio, but Chris said that she didn't want to travel such a long distance by herself, before changing her mind, but saying that she would bring her mum, Barbara, with her. A few days later, Julie's brother Max, told Chris that he and Clyde Cash had kidnapped Julie 
and that Chris had five days to rescue her. Barbara had already warned Chris against meeting Julie because she thought it was a police officer posing as an underage girl, so Chris left at 5.30am, taking only $50 without telling either parent, just leaving a note. When they found the note, they called the police and filed a missing persons report, worried she might get killed as she had never travelled so far out of town before. It's unclear whether or not the police actually looked for her. At one point, Chris accidentally locked herself out of her car, so nearby workers had to call a breakdown company to get her back in. When she arrived at the address Max had given her, there was no sign of him, Clyde or Julie, just an elderly woman who had never heard of any of them, leaving Chris no choice but to return home empty-handed. Surprisingly, Chris actually enjoyed the experience, though his parents weren't so thrilled, and threatened to kick him out if he ever travelled at all again. Within a week of this disastrous event, the truth about Julie would be revealed in a mumble chat, which went so far it was even too much for Clyde. It began with Max taunting Chris, threatening to not only sell her PlayStation account on eBay, but to give the profit to 4chan and Encyclopedia Dramatica. After insulting her throughout and telling her she has to choose between her accounts and Julie, Max eventually orders her to chop up her medallion into pieces and literally stick it where the sun doesn't shine, and she did it. When Chris is finally allowed to talk to Julie, it is revealed that neither her or Max exist, and that they're both personas created by a user named Blue Spike. This wasn't the first time that Chris had been catfished, but this time was so much worse, as Blue Spike was actually a 13-year-old boy. Apparently not knowing that she was being catfished, Chris had literally sent nudes and inappropriate videos to a child. This is all so messed up on so many levels. Throughout this, there is so much that you could criticise Chris for, but what Blue Spike did is just so sadistic. Even at 13, you should know to draw the line way before you're convincing a severely autistic person to put things up there. It apparently didn't take much to fool Chris, and Blue Spike used his normal voice when interacting with her, which most would probably be able to identify as a young boy, but Chris claims not to have noticed. Blue Spike seemed to imply that it's unlikely that Chris didn't realise, but considering she has trouble distinguishing faces, it's possible that this also extends to voices too, but I'm not sure. While Chris didn't initially appear too phased about the whole incident, she later said it was one of the most traumatic things that ever happened to her. Other trolls were present in the chat, and most were disgusted by how far Blue Spike went. Even Clyde got real for once, and didn't exactly show sympathy towards Chris, but basically told her to get her shit together. Years later, Blue Spike has expressed regret over what he did, and acknowledges that it wasn't funny. Only a couple of weeks later, Chris was trolled yet again when she arranged a date with Emily, a journalism student. Chris stood her up the first time as she was stressed because of her parents arguing over whether or not Emily was real or another troll. Spoiler, she was another troll. They rearranged and Chris decided to bring her 81-year-old father with her. The date didn't exactly end well after a man dressed like a pickle showed up to troll Chris. Man in the Pickle Suit was a persona created by one of the trolls behind Blanca, and was a name used by various different trolls. Chris later said she was proud she didn't soil herself when Man in the Pickle Suit appeared. In June 2009, a YouTube channel was created by someone who claimed to be the real Chris Chan, complete with the Sonichu medallion, albeit made of paper. He was eventually referred to as Liquid Chris, while the real Chris was Solid Chris. Liquid claimed that Chris's original accounts had been hacked, and an imposter was now running them. He uploaded parodies of Chris's earlier videos, and eventually, in Chris's mind where fiction and reality merge into one, Liquid was better at being Chris than Chris herself was. Contests were held to determine the real Chris, and Liquid won. In Liquid's farewell message, he said he was married, employed by Nintendo and Microsoft, and referenced Ian Brandon Anderson, who he claimed had taken over Chris's accounts. And from now on, my name is not Ian Brandon something! It seems that there was a time where Solid Chris actually somewhat questioned whether or not she was the real Chris, and had to use logic, for once, to convince herself she was. You really can't make this stuff up. 
In November 2010, following yet another romantic disaster, she deleted all her videos and announced that she would no longer be uploading or interacting with anyone online. A few months later though, she returned, and while it wasn't until 2014 that she came out as transgender, by this point she started to dress more feminine and referred to herself as a tomgirl. This was a pivotal moment for her, not only because it was the beginning of a totally new way of life, but it signalled the beginning of a U-turn regarding her homophobic views. Barbara didn't approve though and told her to stop wearing dresses and makeup and even forcibly cut her hair at one point. The month after Chris's return to the internet, her father Bob died of heart failure which sent her into a deep depression. She didn't seem as able to bounce back from the trolling after this event, leaving many to wonder if it was time to leave her be, but not everyone was so considerate. In October, Chris and Barbara were arrested and charged with trespassing, assault and failure to stop at an accident causing over $1,000 in damage. In 2012, Chris finally lost her virginity, but no thanks to the love quest, which was, by all accounts, a catastrophe. She believed she was facing prison time due to her run-ins with the law and hired a woman to help her cross that off her bucket list. The rest of the year, and most of 2013, was relatively uneventful, with Chris often ranting on Facebook and Twitter, looking for someone to blame for the situation she found herself in. In January 2014, Chris's house set on fire, caused by a frayed extension lead that ran from the bathroom to a coffee maker in the hallway. The unusual and unsafe placement was as a result of Barbara's hoarding habits, which resulted in areas of the home being blocked. Chris and Barbara were okay, but sadly one of their cats died in the fire. After this, their financial situation worsened, partly as a result of many poor decisions, such as Chris spending a considerable amount of money on kids' toys. They begged fans for money or asked them to buy various items on eBay, including signed photos of Chris and Bob's stamp collection. Please, can you buy Christine Chandler's uh, merchandise? to help us pay the mortgage. In August, Chris began identifying as a lesbian, insisting that you can be a male lesbian. It wasn't until December that she announced that she was transgender. Later that month, she assaulted a GameStop employee and later caused a commotion at Walmart, ultimately resulting in a night in jail, a $541 fine and a six month suspended sentence. The transgender announcement would give rise to a couple of baffling and disturbing events. Chris spent months listening to subliminal frequency hypnosis videos, which she believed would give her the result of gender reassignment surgery without the surgery, and eventually decided to make an incision in the crotch area in an attempt to free the v she believed was growing inside her. Over the next couple of years, Chris's views on certain things progressed, and she apologised for her homophobic past. Bab was sued due to racking up $20,000 in debt, sparking what is known as the Financial Crisis, where she and Chris got even more desperate in their begging for money. I said nothing under a dollar in donations. No donations less than one dollar. We need the money. Chris had set up an Etsy page as an extra source of income, but she was banned after she failed to fulfil orders. Tell him, Mom. We need the money. And what do we need it for? For food. So I set up a GoFundMe. Help me achieve a goal of $400 to pay for everything I need. In 2016, she made a Facebook post defending an relationship between a woman and her son. At one point, she openly admitted to dreaming about having sex with her mother, which was creepy enough at the time but even more so considering recent developments in this story. At one point, they reportedly shared a bed together, and it sounds like in general they had what most people would class as an inappropriate relationship. Chris continued to overshare and rant on social media, even making death threats against Donald Trump and Mike Pence. During this time, Chris was catfished by more trolls, at one point believing she was in a relationship with Vanessa Hudgens, and eventually started interacting with another troll, the Idea Guy, soon becoming the Idea Guys, when another troll joined in. 
They gaslighted Chris and manipulated her by role-playing as her imaginary friends and convincing her that they had insider knowledge regarding C.W. Seville. They brainwashed her into believing various things about herself, such as that she was half Sonny Chew, and so was her father and Ted Bundy, which naturally fueled her pre-existing delusions. Due to Chris's almost unbelievably suggestible nature, it has even been theorised that her transgenderism was only as a result of trolls brainwashing her, implanting and reinforcing the idea in her mind over time. No one but Chris would know if this was the case or not, though. A group of people attempted to intervene and stop the idea guy's efforts to drive Chris further into insanity, and she eventually distanced herself, but some of the psychological damage she suffered is likely irreversible. Chris never stopped believing in CW Seville and other dimensions, and when the pandemic began in 2020, she believed it was a sign of the dimensional merge she originally predicted in 2018. However, lockdown resulted in BabsCon, a My Little Pony convention, being cancelled, which led to Chris literally living as Sonny Chew for nearly a year, as in she actually seriously pretended, in real life, to be a fictional character as a coping mechanism. She abandoned the role-playing in February 2021, which more or less brings us to the current situation. Just a few days ago at the time of writing the notes for this video, Chris, now 39, was arrested amid allegations that she had with her 80-year-old mother, who has dementia. Shortly before, a conversation between Chris and an unknown individual was recorded, in which she nonchalantly described her mother on more than one occasion, saying she was partially confused at one point, then came around, but overall enjoys the relationship with Chris. Chris claims that Barbara initiated this contact between them, and seems to believe she's doing it for her benefit. Even if Barbara was in any position to consent, which she isn't due to her age and mental state, and the fact that it's implied she wasn't fully conscious sometimes, it'd still make me sick to think that Chris finally found her sweetheart, and it was her mum all along. After falling down this rabbit hole, I'm left wondering if any of this could have turned out differently. It's undoubtable that the trolls contributed to a deteriorating mental state, but how far would Chris's behaviour have gone, if she was never exposed to the dark depths of the internet. While ultimately, as individuals, we have to be held responsible for our own actions, and Chris needs to face consequences for what she has done, the people who tormented, provoked, and even abused her online also have blood on their hands. I'm not for a second saying that to excuse anything she's allegedly done, it's unforgivable if true, but we're talking about a severely autistic person, who on many occasions has demonstrated that they are extremely immature, don't know right from wrong, and that they are very easily manipulated and brainwashed, not only by people in their life, but strangers on the internet too. From the second Chris was old enough to display such behaviour, she was enabled and in some ways even egged on by her family, she never really had a chance. While I don't agree with many of her prior views or actions, I genuinely felt bad for her before this. I can't imagine how awful it would be to have autism, plus other psychological conditions, to repeatedly put your trust in people and they just manipulate you and try to make you crazy. If Chris did do what she's accused of, and what she's admitted to, which is still a big if, as I could just as much buy that this is all a fantasy that only exists in Chris's head, this wasn't totally unpredictable. The relationship between Chris and Barbara was clearly unhealthy and inappropriate for a long time. So what's next for Chris? Honestly, it doesn't look good. If she gets convicted, even if no other charges are added, such as she faces up to 10 years in prison. When she's out, or in her current situation if she never goes to prison, she may well have nowhere to live, as Barbara will likely go into a nursing home, paid for by the house being sold. It's unlikely any family would take her in, and she has no friends to help her out either. Her best hope is some kind of assisted living facility, as it's next to impossible that she would be able to support herself living independently. There have been a couple of moments where it seemed like Chris might turn a corner, but if she is guilty of the recent accusations, that would be an all-time low, and at the age she's at now, I don't see how she could unlearn such detrimental and deep-rooted behaviour. We'll just have to wait and see where legal proceedings take her, 
as for now she's currently in jail, awaiting her next hearing on the 16th of September, and it's unclear how she intends to plead. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. Have you followed the Chris Chan story and do you have anything else to add if so? If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my patrons, whose names are on screen now. I really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Thursday in a new video.